Right now it's November. The wind is absolutely howling. It's cold. It's kind of miserable out, but I'm as happy as a clam because oyster season just reopened. Today I'm going to show you how to get oysters. Um, this is not that difficult. This is not rocket science. Oysters can't really move around at all. They live on top of the sand. They don't bury in like a clam. So essentially you just need to make sure you're in a spot that has oysters and you're going to find them. Essentially we just kind of walk around here. You can see them. Um, the wind is making it a little bit tough today. It's rippling the water a little bit, but they're still, you know, generally no more than a foot or two deep and they're easy to see. I'm just using my old trusty quahog rake to scoop them up. Um, this particular one is made by KB White, good local company. They, th they make, I think, the best quahog rakes out there. One of these is going to run you probably around 100 bucks. Um, there's certainly cheaper ones out there, but you get a good one like this, take care of it. It'll last 15, 20 years. You're also going to want something to put your tasty clams in, so we have a wire basket. This is a one peck, and we got a nice old inner tube on there, zip tied. That's going to keep that afloat. And really, the only other thing we need is a shellfish license in Massachusetts, which is where we are. Shellfish regulations are dictated on a town by town level. In some places like Rhode Island, New Jersey, it's a state permit. Um, but before you go out and collect any shellfish, look into the regulations and make sure you have a permit if it is required. We also have our trusty shellfish gauge here. These cost you about five bucks. They last forever. We can use this same gauge to measure quahog steamers and oysters. Aside from that, good pair of neoprene gloves. Um, not only to keep your hands warm, but the oysters do have sharp shells. I've gotten cut pretty bad in the past. So you want to make sure you're wearing a pair of gloves when you're getting them and when you're shucking them. So we're going to find most of the oysters in water less than knee deep. Um, right now it's middle of the tide, it's not even low tide. And essentially we're just going to walk around until we see one. There's one there hiding in the weeds. That's a beauty. It's actually a good size one. I always like to, if they have any seaweed growing on them, we want to get that off of there. And you're also going to find a lot of limpets and slipper shells attached to them. So I use my gauge. I'm just gonna pop any growth that's on the shell. Sometimes there'll be barnacles. Sometimes there'll be other baby oysters that we need to pick off. Um, but I mainly pick off these slipper shells because they tend to die after three or four days in the refrigerator and they get stinky. So I take the time as I'm collecting them to go ahead and clean them up. And there's certainly plenty in this area. You will find ones like that that are spent. It's been predated. Um, they, they tend to fool you, but it looks like most of the ones I'm seeing so far are nice, healthy, living oysters. That's another beauty. There's a nice one. So that one looks like it's gonna be probably just barely legally three inches long. This is on the smaller size that you can keep. I have a pretty good eye for them. I'm gonna guess that one is probably right at three inches. So we're gonna measure from the bottom of the gauge to the top end of the opening. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a legal oyster. That one just barely makes the cut. 
And I like to use the smaller ones when I'm eating them raw, just doing these with some cocktail sauce on them. It's a little slice of heaven. When I'm cooking them, I tend to prefer the larger size ones. I'm a big fan of frying oysters and I'm also a big fan of smoking them. And any time I'm doing that, I'm looking for the bigger oysters. Something like this is gonna shrivel up pretty small once it's cooked. So we use the little ones to eat raw, the big ones we cook. Grip blunk. Holy oyster, that's a monster right there. You can see it's got a lot of those limpets growing on it. Those are actually called slipper shells, which are actually edible. I have eaten those before, and they're actually pretty tasty. They're sweet, but they're a lot of work to eat. And there's a lot of oysters here, so I'm just gonna let all those guys go. And we really need to be on the lookout for seed oysters growing on these. Um, I haven't seen any yet. But by law, if there is a seed growing on an oyster, you do need to remove it and put it back into the ocean. A bigger one like that, that would be great for the smoker or if we're doing a fried oyster, make a po' boy sandwich. Other thing I look for when I'm harvesting them is I want ones that are gonna be easy to shuck. You can see that the hinge here is real accessible. Sometimes you'll get them and the hinge will be kind of turned over to the side. And there's so many of them out here that I'll just let any oddball looking ones I just throw them back and really look for the, the prettiest oysters I can find. Oh, here we go, I found the mother load. I'm just gonna drag the quahog rake along the bottom. We don't need to get in that deep. We don't wanna kick up the mud a whole lot. Once I get into an area that's really thick with them, I try not to move my feet around a whole lot and I just kinda work the perimeter. We don't wanna stir up the bottom. And really, for me, what takes the longest is just picking all the growth off of the shells. See, that one's kind of funky. He's got a big curve in his shell. Let him go. There's certainly enough of these things around where we can be fussy with the ones that we're taking home. So here we have a seed oyster, this little circular thing here growing on top of an adult oyster. We want to make sure we scrape that off. Chances are it's probably going to die, but it also has a chance of living better than if we throw it in our basket and bring it home. So by law, you do need to um, remove any seed oysters that are growing on the shelves. It's always a good sign to see those seeds because that means that these are naturally reproducing out here. So it's kind of an interesting story how we got this oyster program going in town. Um, when I first moved to Cape Cod in 1996, we had a pretty robust wild oyster population and you could go out and get them. And I actually, for one year, I, I did it commercially and decided it was a lot of work and I'd stick with a desk job, but there was certainly enough of them around that you could, um, you know, harvest them. But then it was around 2000, there was a virus came in called the dermovirus. And it really did a number on all the wild oysters. And um, we had two really bad winters in a row where the temperatures were brutally cold, which a lot of the oysters get exposed at low tide, they froze. And we also had an outbreak of oyster drills, which are little whelks that actually drill into the oysters and eat them. And by around the year 2000, there pretty much wasn't any wild oysters left. Um, but some researchers at Rutgers University, they were working on the genetics and they came up with a strain of oyster that was resistant to the, the virus. And that's what you now find in all the oyster farms that are around. Um, those all basically came from seed from Rutgers University.
All right, so we're allowed to take one peck of oysters a week. We see we're almost there. I like to kind of take my time and stack them in there as tightly as possible. I'll share these with friends and family. And I eat a ton of these. In season, I'll eat four or five oysters every night. Um, I like to do a couple big batches of smoked oysters. I like to fry them, make some fried oyster pool boy sandwiches. Um, there's certainly a number of other recipes you can do with them. They're pretty versatile. And a uh, great way to get outside in the off season, get some fresh air, bring home some good eats. All right, that's a wrap. All right, we managed to gather a nice pile of fresh oysters here. Now I'm gonna show you how to shuck them, and I'm also gonna show you one of my favorite recipes to use with fresh oysters. The glove I'm using here is made by Rapala. This is actually a filet glove. It's cut resistant. It's made out of Kevlar. Um, also works great when we're shucking oysters. And I'm not so much worried about the knife going into my hand, which can certainly be an issue, um, but I wear it more to protect from the sharp edges along the edge of the oyster shell. So we're gonna to wanna to hold the oyster flat like this. We don't wanna lose any of that liquid that's inside the shell. We're gonna take our oyster knife. We're gonna insert that at the hinge. We're gonna kinda of press on it and wiggle it back and forth three or four times until it gets planted in there pretty good. And then we just pop that top shell off. And there is an abductor muscle inside the oyster. It sits about right here. And we need to separate that on the top and bottom. So we'll take our knife run it along that top shell. You can see that muscle right there. And we also need to separate that from the bottom shell. So we just run our knife under it, loosen it around the edges, it's good to go. Also, when you're shucking oysters, you want to try to reserve as much of the liquid that's inside the shell as you can. It's often called liquor, um, especially if you're eating the oysters raw. Try not to let that water drip out of them when you're shucking. One of my favorite ways to eat an oyster is to simply eat it raw. Uh, it's a very primal thing. There's really not many things out there that you eat while they're actually still alive. Oyster is one of the few I can think of. And um, it took me a long time to really get into eating them like this, but a little, little bit of black pepper. Some homemade cocktail sauce. You just want a dash. down the hatch. Delicious. So now I'm gonna show you one of my favorite recipes for cooking oysters. I learned this recipe from Dave Ryan, who is an oyster farmer here on Cape Cod. He runs um, several farms for Wiano Oysters. And I got to know him, he's a big chef too. And um, you know, I asked him, what's your favorite way to eat oysters, being an oyster farmer? And this is the recipe he gave me. And it's one of my go-tos. So I'm gonna start by shucking a dozen oysters. We wanna make sure we save all that juice that's inside of them. So good. All right, first step is we need to make some crostinis. So we have a lovely French baguette. We make 12 slices, about a half an inch thick. Now we're just gonna lay these out on a metal baking sheet. I'm gonna brush them with a little extra virgin olive oil. And we're gonna pot these into a 350 degree oven for about eight to 10 minutes until they get nice and crispy. So we're 
going to dice this up pretty fine. Start with a half a stick of butter. And normally I would use unsalted butter for this because the oysters certainly provide plenty of salt. This is salted butter, but that's all I have at the moment, so that'll work. Now we need to melt the butter. We're going to want about three, three to four tablespoons of fresh tarragon. Dried will work in a pinch, but I really prefer to use fresh when I can. And tarragon isn't an herb that I use a whole lot, um, but it goes really well with the oysters. I have a number of recipes that combine oysters and tarragon. They really work well together. Yeah, we just want to pick all the leaves off of the stems. The stems can be a little bit chewy. Once the butter is melted, we're going to add the shallot. We're going to cook this down for about two minutes. Our crostinis are ready. They're nice and crisp. We've been in there about 10 minutes. We're going to pull those out, set them aside. Once the shallots have started to soften, we're going to hit that pan with a cup and a half of a dry white wine. This is a Sauvignon Blanc. You could use a Pinot Grigio. Now we're going to turn the heat up to high and we're going to want to reduce this wine down by about a half. So I'm going to just kind of gauge it, roll it up in the side of the pan so I can get an eye for how much is in there. This is probably going to take five or six minutes to reduce down. While well, that's cooking, we can arrange our lovely crostinis on a platter. All right, I'd say this is finally reduced by about a half. Now we're going to add most, but not all of our tarragon. We're going to save a little bit to garnish with at the end. stir, spread it out. And now we're going to add our dozen shucked oysters along with the liquor. Give each one a quick flip and then they'll be done. You really only want to cook those for two to three minutes tops. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna top each crostini with a nice oyster. Looks like I miscounted. One snack. Now we're going to spoon on some of our lovely wine tarragon sauce on top of these guys. You want to have a good amount of sauce in the bottom of the pan. And those crostines are going to absorb that up from the bottom. Take some of the crunch away. Now we'll just pretty them up with a little bit more of that fresh tarragon for garnish. And boom, there you have it. Oyster Dave's Oyster Delights. These are probably one of my favorite all time oyster recipes staple in my kitchen. Um, pretty simple, straightforward to make and makes an absolutely great appetizer. So don't mind if I do. It's got a nice crunch, there's a good amount of saltiness in it. That tarragon and the oyster really works well together. It's really a match made in heaven.